Yeah.
here going to observe the Lord's Supper together. Uh, the Lord's Supper is a church declaration. It's the body of Christ declaring to one another that we understand that we are only made right by the, by the gift of Jesus Christ, his death on the cross, his shed blood that atones for our sins. So we, we declare that that's the only way we are made right, but then we are praising God as we partake of the Lord's Supper because indeed in Christ we are made right with God. And that's what we do in the Lord's Supper. So we do ask that only those of you who've placed your faith in Christ join us in this because you're the only ones who can make that testimony. When Paul was giving instructions to the church and, and speaking about the Lord's Supper, he talked about it because to the church in Corinth because they were messing it up. They weren't thinking about it the right way. And so here's what he says. He says, in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it's not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. He says, if you're coming together to celebrate this supper, that says, we are the body of Christ because of Jesus, you can't come together and be focused on the things that tear you apart. You have to be focused on that one thing that brings you together. And so he goes on then in verse 23, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So this morning we're going to do as we have been doing. Uh, the praise team will lead us in a song, and as they do, just ask that you would come up the middle aisle, pick up the elements. It's one stacked cup with the, the, the bread in one and the, and the juice in the other. Take that back to your seat and then after everybody's served and we're finished the song, we'll observe the Lord's Supper together. <laughs> 
Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, as we observe this Lord's Supper, God, we do so in remembrance of Jesus, your Son, who came as the sinless one and offered himself as a sacrifice, paying the price for our sins so that we wouldn't have to, and offering us his righteousness. So God, as we eat the bread and drink from the cup, God, draw our eyes to Christ, the crucified one and risen one. We pray this in his name. Amen. And separate the cups. And as we eat the bread, we remember the body of Christ, sacrificed on a cross willingly to rescue us from what we deserve. And then as we drink from the cup, we remember the shed blood of Christ, the atoning blood of Christ that takes our sins that were red as scarlet and washes them white as snow. Praise God for Jesus. You may be seated. Well, back on July the 7th, one of our former presidents celebrated a, uh, a rather remarkable milestone. On, on July the 7th, Jimmy and Rosalind Carter celebrated their 75th wedding anniversary. They are now the longest married presidential couple ever. And President Carter, I think, gave some very good advice when they asked the question that they always ask somebody that's been married a long time. How'd you do it? Right? He said, first of all, choose the right person to marry. And then he said, and every night we try to make sure we're completely reconciled from all the arguments of the day. And, and that's good advice. Quite honestly, it's good advice because it's biblical advice. Don't let the sun go down on your anger, the Bible tells us, Right? Now, I'm not trying to tell you that Jimmy Carter is awesome. I probably wouldn't. But 75 years of marriage is awesome. That, that is an amazing testimony to faithfulness. Faithfulness. The Apostle Paul would likely agree with that, by the way, that 75 years of marriage is awesome. After all, in the first century Roman Empire, in those days, if you survived birth, which that was a 50-50 proposition, if you survive birth, the average lifespan was 35 to 40 years. So the idea that somebody would be married for 75 would have been unheard of in first century Rome. Conversely, though, Paul would, while he would be impressed with 75 years of marriage, as we've been looking at the, the book of 1 Corinthians, we saw in chapter 6, he was not impressed with the church in Corinth. They were his brothers in Christ. He made a big deal out of that at the beginning, but he's been pointing out several of their shortcomings. In fact, the beginning of chapter 6, he was speaking about sexual sin as a problem in the church in Corinth. He was telling them that it is a real big problem and that they're not treating it like one. In fact, what is even worse than the problem itself is the fact that they, as a church, seem to be endorsing it by the fact they tolerate it in the family. So in, in six chapters, Paul has really already laid out some pretty bad news for the church in Corinth as to how they're following Jesus. He said, you guys are just getting it all wrong. Well, praise God, there's chapter seven. And, and in chapter seven, there's good news. So we, get it, we have a Sunday here of good news. So if I present it, it sounds like bad news, you'll know I've blown it, right? It is, is a Sunday of good news. It comes in response to something the folks in Corinth has, have written in a letter 
to the Apostle Paul. It seems that they were wrestling with this problem of the relationship between men and women. And so they wrote to him, and it says in chapter 7, verse 1, they wrote, here's what they decided. It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with the woman. So they had come to believe that the best way to handle this whole mess was celibacy. That, that men and women would stay apart. Well, Paul doesn't agree. He doesn't think that's actually the right answer. And the reason he doesn't think that is because God has already shown that that's not the right answer. Um, so if you would, I'd ask that you're, you stand in honor of God's word if you're able. And I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We'll actually be looking at the, the whole chapter, so it's, it's a bit of a long reading. 1 Corinthians 7. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But because of the temptation to sexual morality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now, as a concession, not a command, I say this, I wish that all were as I myself am, but each one has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am, but if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to be aflame with passion. To the married I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. To the rest I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy." But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. Wife, how do you know whether you will save your husband? Husband, how do you know whether you will save your wife? Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a slave when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. For he who was called in the Lord as a slave is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he was free when called is a slave of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. So brothers, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God. Now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in the view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they have none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, 
and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. If anyone thinks he is not behaving properly toward his betrothed, if his passions are strong and it is has to be, let him do as he wishes, let them marry. It is no sin. But whoever is firmly established in his heart, being or under no necessity, but having his desire under control, and has determined this in his heart, to keep her as his betrothed, he will do well. So then he who marries his betrothed does well, and he who refrains from marriage will do even better. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. Yet in my judgment, she is happier if she remains as she is. And I think that I too have the Spirit of God. Father, this is your word, and we ask that you would speak through your word to our minds and our hearts, that we might know you well and follow you to your glory. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, I am not going to go through every verse in that passage. There, there is a lot in 1 Corinthians 7. I'm not even going to take the verses in order. I think Paul's outline here is almost too complicated to handle that way. So what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the three groups that Paul addresses and look at the main thing he is saying to each of them. Because I think sometimes when we look at 1 Corinthians 7, we, we miss the forest for the trees. And there's a really important message here. This is about good news. The, in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul describes God's plan for relationships between men and women. It really is that simple. It's God's plan for relationships between men and women. A plan that is helpful for you no matter where you find yourself this morning. You are covered in this chapter, whoever you are. So let, let's look at God's plan for the relationships between men and women. First, let's look at God's plan for married couples. God's plan for married couples, because that's the first group Paul addresses. Paul gives us God's plan for married couples in a lot of detail, but I want to boil it down to three things. Three things he says that I, that I, that I think are, are, are life-altering if we take them to heart. They will be good news in our lives if we take them to heart. The first thing he says is that married couples are to seek to satisfy one another. In the first five verses, that married couples are to seek to satisfy one another. Now, I am sure you can read that and understand how people will abuse that passage. They'll say, look, you are supposed to try to satisfy me. That's not what he's wanting you to get out of this. That is terribly sad because that's actually the opposite of what he wants you to get. Husband, you need to live as though your wife's physical needs and desires matter more than your own. Wife? You are to live as though your husband's physical needs and desires matter more than your own. And the only time this isn't true is when you call a family prayer meeting. Right? I mean, that's what he says. If you all want to get together and just devote yourselves to Jesus for a bit, that's fine. But otherwise, you work at satisfying her. You work at satisfying him. And the reason for God's plan is simple. It's very simple. Because if you don't do it, someone else out there would be glad to. Let's be clear. The, the spouse that goes to, to out there into the world is not justified. All right? It doesn't do that, right? It doesn't say, well, if your wife doesn't do this, go wherever you want. So that is still sin. It's wicked and it's sin. 
This, is much, this word is much like what Paul says in Ephesians 5. In Ephesians 5, he says what? He says, husbands, love your wives sacrificially. Do it like Christ loved his church. And wives, submit to your husbands willingly like the church submits to Christ. And here he says, husbands, give everything you've got, including your own preferences to her. Wives, give everything you've got, including your own preferences to him. It's the same picture. Married couples are to seek to satisfy one another. That's, that's the first good news. I mean, that's God's plan. So if, if that's what you do, this will be good news in your marriage. The second point is that married couples are to stay with one another for life. Verses 10 through 16, that's his point. Well, I mean, look at how he argues this. Wives should not leave their husbands. Husbands should not divorce their wives. Not even... Not even if one spouse becomes a Christian and the other's an unbeliever. Because you can see they might think, well, now I'm a Christian. I need a Christian marriage. First century, new church. He says, no, no, no. It's still that way. Wives don't leave your husbands. Husbands do not divorce your wives. And the only exception he says, it says, okay, but if the unbeliever leaves the marriage, let them go in peace. And the reason he says that is because you want to keep the peace so that you might lead them to Christ. You let them go in peace, the unbeliever, because you want to reach them with the gospel. I mean, the key here is not the exception, though. I mean, you, you don't worry about putting the roof on a house till you lay the foundation, and the foundation is what matters here. And the foundation is till death do you part. The discussion about the unbelieving spouse starts with, till death do you part. Paul recognizes an unbeliever might not follow God's plan. Surprise. But even if they don't, keep the peace with them the best you can because you might lead them to Jesus. Can you see the heart of God at work here? Can you see what he's doing? The God's goal is two believers in a lifelong marriage. That is God's passionate desire for your marriage. God seeks lifelong mixed marriages too. And the reason he does that is because the believer married to the unbeliever who's able to do that for life is most likely to lead that believer to Christ, most likely to make that home a godly home. And so Paul says marriage is for life. God wants even the spouse whose unbelieving mate walked out on them to love them and seek them for Christ. So point one is very simple, right? Married couples are to seek to satisfy one another. Point two is just as simple. Married couples are to stay together with one another for life. And the third point about God's plan for marriages is this. Married couples are not to live like this life is all there is. Married couples are not to live like this life is all there is, verses 29 to 35. This passage is more complicated, but what it boils down to this is if this life was all there is, marriage is probably the best thing there is, and so you would live for each other like you were married to your God. But what he says here, he says, no, that's not the way it is. The time is short, he says. This world is passing away. In other words, this life is not all there is. So don't live like this life is all there is in your marriage. Even goes so far, I mean, he says, husband, live like you don't have a wife, wife, live like you don't have a husband. Now, he's not meaning that in its entirety or verses one through five would make no sense, right? What he's saying is, don't live like this, this marriage thing, is everything. Because this life is all there is. I mean, that would go against verse 1 through 5. But if we read 30 through 31, 30 and 31, we get the point. Let those who have wives live like they had none. Okay? But let those who mourn live like they're not mourning. Because why are they mourning? They're grieving something they've lost in this life. Okay, let those who rejoice, rejoice as though they were not rejoicing. Why, why should they quit rejoicing? Because they're rejoicing over something they've got in this life. 
Let those who buy as though they had no goods, because goods are temporary in this life. Let those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it, because this world is passing away. Paul's not telling these folks, though, to go become hermit monks. He's not saying, go get married, don't join a convent or a monastery, join a marriage-estery. I made that up, but if somebody's got a better word, you can give that to me later. But he's not saying that you need to go be hermits. That's not his point. What he's saying is invest in your marriage in ways that invest for eternity. Use your marriage as a tool for eternity. Invest in your marriage in things that, that matter more than the here and now. You're going to be tempted if you are married and you really love your spouse. You're going to be tempted to live like your spouse is the end of all things. Right? I mean, if you really love your spouse and marriage is the best thing God gives us in this world, and I think if you don't have you know, eternity, that would be a good argument because it's going to be the closest relationship you will ever have and you're going to be tempted to think, I should live my life entirely for them. But Paul says, well, this life is short. That would be investing in a little thing when you have eternity before you. And that would be wrong. Instead, what the two of you do, come together and invest your marriage in eternity. While, while you're giving to your spouse, you're bowing in worship to God alone. So let's sum up God's plan for married couples. God's plan for married couples is that they'll seek to satisfy one another, they'll stay together forever, and they'll live like this life is not all there is. Married friends, if 1 Corinthians 7 feels like it is stepping on your toes, then welcome to the club. Right? Welcome to the club. I, 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 first of all, I want to probably assure you of this. Almost every married couple in the room should be feeling that way a little bit. But remember, I said, I, I said this is good news. Right? This is good news. So as we look at this and you say, wait a minute, verses 1 through 5... I'm sometimes selfish. Well, okay, you're sometimes selfish. Are, are we recognize that, that divorce fills the room and our families? Right? I mean, the reality of divorce is just everywhere. Right? Okay, we recognize that. And, and really, who amongst us has not demanded that our spouse satisfy us in ways that only God can never satisfy us? Demanded that they be more than any human being could ever be. Right, so we recognize that and we go, wow, I thought this was good news. It's feeling like bad news. No, here's the good news. This is good news. Because if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Which means you can be forgiven right now if that's your sin. And you can start right now enjoying God's plan for your marriage. This can start for you today. No matter what is in the past, this can start for you today. You can be forgiven of any sin. Christ's death on the cross was sufficient for every sin. So if you have sin in your past, in these areas, you say, well, God, forgive me. Really, turn it over to him. Let him forgive you. And then say, and I want the good answer. I want this plan for my marriage today. And it can be yours. You can have the joy of the Lord in your marriage today today. So this is good news. God has a plan for married couples, but that's not the end of the story. God has a plan for single people too. God has a plan for single people too, which makes sense that Paul, the single guy, would not skip that part, right? I mean, he, he wouldn't just tell married people about the great plan God has for them. He wants to tell single people about the great plan God has for them too. And begins with this, and, and the, the single passages are bounced all over, but I'll, I'll give you the verses in a minute. First thing he says is single, and there's three points again. It's like pastor brain. He's got three points. Single people, first of all, are to be content with singleness. That, that's the first thing. Single people are to be content with singleness. Verse 8. 
If you can, it's good to remain single like Paul as, as someone sold out to Christ. Verse 17 to 24, understand this. The current life that God has given you, the lot you have in life right now is given from God and that's good. And he gives examples. He gives a religious example of circumcision. He gives the example of slavery. He says, look, just be content with what God has given you right now. In verse 37, he even says, if you're formally engaged, if you're betrothed, stay single in that if you can manage it. Right? He says, that'd be the best. Just, just don't even finish off this whole marriage plan. Cancel the hall, right? That means what he's saying. Now, now, Paul does not hate marriage, right? We've already seen that. Paul wrote Ephesians 5, right? So, and Paul does not hate marriage. But what he is saying is this. There is a beauty that comes with contentment. And, and he recognizes that the, the culture, be it in the church or out of the church, is going to tell single people there's something wrong with them if they're not married. It's going to treat singleness like it's some kind of sickness. And Paul doesn't want you to do that. He wants you to say, wow, God has given me this good situation. And he's going to explain how it's good. And so I should really be content with that. This is a gift from God. Be content that God has you single right now. That's the first point for singleness. The second point, though, is that single people should get married rather than give in to sin is that single people should get married rather than give in to sin. Verse 9, if your passions get to be too much for a member of the opposite sex, marriage is a fine answer for that problem. Get married. That's what he says. Verse 36, if your passions are too strong, marry. Even though I said singleness is awesome, it's not a sin. If your passions are strong, to get married. Verse 38, if you're engaged, Stay single, get married, whichever works, but, but, but be content with what God gave you. And if your passions are great, get married. And so God understands biology. God created us. These genes we're packing and these hormones that do crazy things to our brains, he put them in there. Right? So he understands. He understands that whole man, woman thing. He created us that way. He didn't have to, chose to, created us that way. And when the biological urges get to be too much, he created something for that, and it's called marriage. Right? I mean, that's, that's simple. He said, look, I, I wished you could all just be content being single, because then you can be devoted to the Lord. But if that's not the thing, if there's a physical thing keeping you from that, get married. So the call to contentment in singleness is not a demand that you fight temptation until you break. It's, it's saying that, that if you're single right now and that person's not in your life, be happy that you're single. But when that, that, that relationship comes along and it's time to deal with it, get married. So single people are to be content with singleness. Single people are to marry rather than give in to sin. And, verse, and the third point, single people are to consider the dark times. They're to consider the dark times. Look at verse 25 to 28. Verses 25 to 28, he starts talking about the betrothed and, and, and things about this, but then he starts talking about how things are dark now. He's already said this, life is short, but now he says that, that these, are, these are fallen days, they're times of distress. He says this present distress is what he's talking about, or this coming distress, maybe you translate it. He's saying this world is broke, and it is fallen and there is sin everywhere. And you, as a Christian, a follower of Jesus, you're going to have to work hard to fight the temptation of sin. You know, this is the same man who said, put on the full armor of God, right? He's saying that this battle against this, this fallen world is hard. It may be that in your singleness, God is equipping you to win the battle, that through your singleness, God is giving you a special gift for this moment to win the battle. Because if you were married, you might 
Instead, be distracted by your marriage when in right now you need to win the battle in this present distress. So recognize that, that your singleness is a gift from God so that you can focus on him in times like these and not have to focus on a spouse. So how do we sum up God's plan for single people? God's plan for single people is that they'll be content in their current lot, marry if it keeps them from sin, and consider the dark days that we live in now, and singleness is a gift from God in those dark days. Now, being single in our culture is not easy. I, I recognize that. It's been a long time, but I, I still remember. But, but being single is not easy. I mean, the church has often made, it, made itself a hard place to be single, hasn't it? I mean, we've made single people feel like not getting married by age 20 and having half a dozen kids was somehow pagan. I mean, I, I've seen it. Paul would not buy that argument. Paul disagrees. He says the best way to handle singleness is recognize it that right now that is a gift from God to you. So that you can use it to focus your life on Him and doing things that glorify Him in your singleness. He's saying that it's a good time to be content. You don't have to be on the hunt for a spouse. That is not required of you if you're single. It's great to be single, Paul says. I mean, he uses the word better, doesn't he? It's how he ends it. So, I mean, be content in this. Understand that God has given you the freedom you might need to deal with dark days. Now, if God brings that special someone along and you realize that, that your mind is thinking way too much about stuff that should only happen in a marriage bed, get married. That's the answer. Don't make the command to be content in singleness make you some sort of physical passion martyr. That's not the point. But the point is to be content in singleness and recognize it's a gift from God. And I hope if you're single this morning, you find this refreshing. Because this is good news. This is good news. You are not strange. You are not odd. You're not somehow failed. You are in the place God has placed you and it's a gift from God for you in that place. But if the day comes when everything points to marriage, it's also okay to get married. So you've got like the best of both worlds if you're single. So God has a plan for married couples, a plan for single people, but God also has a plan at the end of the story here, a short message for widows and widowers. A plan for widows and widowers. He addresses a special class of people, really the widows. In his day, the widow had a bad, bad way. The widow was in a rough spot. In, in Paul's day, the widow, if, if her family did not commit to take care of her, she was in real trouble. So widows asked things like, what do I do now? The reality, I think we would all recognize, is that widows and widowers in our day ask the same question. What do I do now? You, you've devoted life to life with a spouse. You spent a lot of life committed to marriage and now suddenly you're without, you're a widow or you're a widow or what do you do? Paul's description of God's plan for the widow is very short, only two points and really only two verses. And it's great. Well, I mean, look at what he says. He says, first of all, verse 39, if you're a widow or a widower, you're free to remarry. And it is, it's, you're free to be married to whom you wish. In the Lord, Christians marry Christians. The, the Bible teaches that marriage is indeed until death do you part. Till death do you part. We don't have some sort of eternal ceiling like Mormonism. We don't believe in that. Marriage is till death do you part. When one spouse dies, the other spouse is free to remarry. With the caveat given in verse 40. In verse 40... He says, yet you'll be happier if you reign as you are. So what is he saying? He's saying, widows and widowers, 
you're free to remarry, but until that time, see my instructions on being single. That's, that's really what he's saying. He's saying when your spouse passes, you're single. He's really given you that freedom. And you, if you have ever dealt with the loss of a spouse in someone's life, you know this is not easy. Isn't it good news that it's right there in God's word that says you are free? You are free. You don't have to guess. So that, that's God's plan for the widower. Widower, be free and think like a godly single person. That's his plan. God is good. You see, when it comes to the relationship between men and women, God's word is not silent, and it is good. He has a word for married couples. He tells them to seek to satisfy one another, stay together for life, and live like this life is not all there is. He has a word for single folks. He says, be content in your singleness, but marry if it keeps you from sin, and just don't forget these are dark days and your singleness might be a gift from God to help you stand in these dark days. And he doesn't forget the widow and the widower because our God would not do that. He says, widow and widower, you are free. Live like a godly single person and make those marriage decisions like they do. Friends, this is good news. We live in a world that tells us lie after lie after lie about the relationships between men and women. And they don't have anything to do with God's word. And the reason is simple. The world outside the body of Christ does not believe the gospel. And so they're not going to come to these answers because they don't believe the gospel. Think about the foundational truth of the gospel. We're all sinners. And we deserve nothing but suffering from God's hand, both now and forever. But God loved mankind, even though mankind was in wicked rebellion. And as a result, God sent His Son, as we have observed in the Lord's Supper, God sent His Son to be a sacrifice, paying the price they should have paid, and offering them His righteousness. And He accomplished His work, rose again, proving the work was done. So the right response would be turn away from our sin, accept his good gift of grace, and follow Jesus. Once you believe that is good news, once you believe in that good news, you trust in Jesus, you can live a life trusting Jesus, right? If you believe Jesus can rescue you from the eternal suffering your life has earned, you can trust him for anything. I mean, if you can trust him for your biggest problem, you can trust him for anything. That means you can trust him in your relationships, in your marriage, and in your singleness. Because he's a good news God. And this is good news for marriage. Married Christians, because of the gospel, you can trust God to give you joy as you seek the joy of your spouse. You can stay married knowing that the grace and forgiveness that saved you from hell can do wonders in your marriage. Because of the gospel, you can live your married life looking for eternity, seeking first the kingdom of God together and His righteousness, trusting that everything else He will take care of single Christian. Because of the gospel, you can be content in your singleness. You do not need a spouse to give you joy. You have the almighty God who loved you and sent Jesus for you. You could also be free to marry single Christian because God has provided a way for you to deal with things that might lead you to temptation. But single person, you can also feel free to devote your entire life to Jesus and be victorious in dark days using your singleness as a tool in the combat against this fallen world. And widows and widowers, because of the gospel, you don't need to carry the burden of trying to remain faithful to a deceased spouse. You are free because of Christ. You can live free like a gospel-shaped single person. Friends, 
Jesus saves, and that makes everything better. It makes marriage better. It makes singleness better. It makes everything better. This is God's good news for you in your marriage and your singleness. I mean, there used to be all those witnessing tools, right? We just, God has a good, great plan for your life. That's how you'd start the conversation. God has a wonderful plan for your life. You need to make sure you say, if you believe and follow Jesus, because otherwise his plan for your life is eternal hell. But God has a wonderful plan for your life. Well, Christian, what this passage, what 1 Corinthians 7 says, is God has a wonderful plan for your marriage. God has a wonderful plan for your singleness. And you can find joy and hope in God's good plan. So let me encourage you. Follow his plan. Follow his plan and know the joy that is yours there. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that not only did you save us from sin, you have offered us these good gifts and your good word to help us live in the joy of our Lord. And God, I pray that this morning, God, if there's one here who has not placed their faith in Jesus Christ in the first place, I pray that this would be the day that they would believe in Jesus Christ and be saved. And Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ. I pray that we would take your word to heart. Lord, that, that we would look at your plan for marriage and make that our plan for our marriages. That we would look at your plan for singleness and make that our plan for singleness. And, and, and I do pray that, that, Lord, we would be sure to encourage widows and widowers with this good news as well. God, you are gracious and you are good. God, help us to obey where we fail. Reveal it to our eyes that we might repent and be forgiven. And may we know the joy of our Lord. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Brother Tom's going to come lead us in our closing hymn. And as he does... I would ask you to deal with God's word in your life. Um, talked about how, so I would just ask you to do it. Deal with God's word. You, you can sing while we sing, and, and if God's dealing with your life, you can stop singing and deal with it right there. You can come forward and ask us to help you walk through this together as the body of Christ. But I would just encourage you, deal with God's word in your life. Please stand.
couple of things. 